It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. Glad to have you guys out there. You know... Morning, I see new cities coming on on our streaming uh, side on our website. It's great news. I see Spokane out there this morning and Lincoln. I see Baltimore again, uh, Palm Coast, uh, Ennis, Texas again, Chesterfield. I see Chicago, uh, see Texas. So I'm glad to have you guys on board. Thank you very much for joining with us. Um, you know, we're going to uh, kind of cover four different topics, which is our normal uh, mantra this morning. By the way, for the record, Patriot FB is back up. And um, they had some server issues that they resolved, and they are now back on the air. And uh, thank goodness for that, because that's a great, uh, great organization and a great group. If you have not yet had an opportunity to go to Patriot FB, I strongly encourage you to do that. It's Patriot F like Foxtrot, B like Bravo, or a replication of Patriot Facebook. And uh, so essentially, Patriot FB is a great opportunity for you to catch uh, awesome streaming uh, radio, a group of patriotic hosts that are uh, really candid about what they uh, see wrong with our nation, and uh, I'm among them. So I'd love to have you catch our, uh, our program streaming there if you can in the mornings. Thanks to the folks over at Rooster Radio. Glad to be on with uh, Big Country 99 in South Central Missouri. Okay, we're, we're going to touch on the real numbers of Obamacare this morning and why that matters. Because the truth is, it does matter. And it matters for this reason. We have to pay for it. All of us. And so, how many people sign up and realistically are, are you know, participants versus how many people um, are, are sham participants? And, and when I say that, I don't mean that individuals tried to fake anything. I'm talking about the administration playing games with the numbers so that they can use the old adage of lies or damn lies and statistics, right? And so the, the issue of how many people are really on Obamacare matters to us. Our second issue is going to be when, when liberals think Obama's gone too far. And the reason I bring this topic up is because we all know he's been extensively utilizing or abusing his executive authority. And Jonathan Turley, who is, for all intents and purposes, a guy who is a liberal, in fact, he admits he voted for Obama, and he admits that he agrees with most of his policies. But he has come out and made a very, very interesting uh, statement or series of statements, and we're going to... um, we're going to make sure that you get a chance to at least hear that this morning. If I can, if I can I'll, I'll, I'll get it up on video as well. But the issue here from his perspective is that he's calling uh, the, the latest abuse of, of executive authority a dangerous expansion of powers. Now, he's a liberal constitutional law professor. He works at George Washington University Law School. He's a professor and an educator there. He's an Obama voter and a self-admitted supporter of most of the, these programs that he that Obama has advanced. But he has an enormous amount to say about how these unconstitutional actions relate to the regret that Americans are going to feel at a later date when we look back historically and determine, wow, we should have done something. He also points out that there is a bit of a cult of personality that's growing around this president and how dangerous that is. It's interesting to hear a guy who is a critical thinker And how, and and I I use that phrase for a reason. He's a critical thinker because he's a guy who's willing to step outside of his own biased beliefs and look objectively at the truth. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the hallmark of critical thinking. Our third topic is going to be debt increase, and there's no ceiling in sight. What transpired yesterday with the Senate passing and approving the uh, unlimited budget deal until March of 2015, pulls out all the stops. 
There is no limit now to what this administration can borrow between now and March of 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a year and, and a month away. And over the course of the next 13 months, there is no check, no balance, no oversight on what this administration can borrow. Judging by past experience, we can expect at least a trillion to somewhere between a trillion and a trillion three. But the truth is, there would be nothing stopping them from borrowing a trillion seven or two trillion. That, ladies and gentlemen, is danger. And I cannot believe that McConnell in the Senate and his group capitulated. I cannot believe that Boehner and the conservatives in the House gave in, no limits, no restrictions, a completely wide open blank check. They, they didn't just give him a blank check. They gave him a blank check and then they handed him a Mont Blanc pen to write it out with. I'm infuriated and you should be too. Our fourth topic is going to be let him eat cake. You know, Michelle Obama and, and Barack Obama yet the other day hosted a state dinner for Hollande. He's the president of France. He's a clear avowed socialist. He has just been responsible for instituting a tax of 75% on incomes over a million dollars. Clearly a socialistic tactic. Michelle, on the flip side of the fence, threw an all-out, no-holds-barred state dinner at an extravagant and lavish cost to the taxpayer, and she wore a $12,000 dress. Really? In a time of austerity when $12,000, for the record, is greater than 80% of the world's average annual income, Michelle has the unmitigated goal to wear a $12,000 dress to a state dinner. Not to mention a $12,000 dress to a state dinner honoring a guy who believes that it's appropriate to tax millionaires at 75% of their income. Huh? I mean... Talk about not practicing what you preach. I mean, I don't expect her to show up in sackcloth, but I do expect her to be appropriately attired <clears throat> and not, I mean, let's be candid, ladies and gentlemen, we paid for this dress. Michelle didn't write a check for this dress. Okay. I'm, the reason I use the term let them eat cake is because that's the phrase made famous by Marie Antoinette as the people of France, which is ironic <laughs> and, and well tied, uh, were starving in the streets. And her response was let them eat cake, which showed her complete and utter tone deafness to the crisis that was enveloping our nation. And the truth is, we're sitting in that same situation today. We have 90 million Americans who cannot find work even though they want to. We have a country that is coming apart at the seams economically, politically, ideologically, spiritually. And yet, Michelle has the nerve to show up in a $12,000 dress to honor a socialist. You can't get more ironic than that. All right, let's break into our first topic here, Obamacare and the enrollment numbers. Yesterday they came out and said the numbers hit 3.3 million, but not really. Now, they won't tell us what the really is. <laughs> and the reason that this matters is because we're responsible to pay for all of this. Right now, the best estimate that they can give us is going to be 2.2. Hang on. Buckle up. Grab a hold of the, arm, the arms on your, on your chair. Two trillion dollars. And it's two trillion we don't have. At the end of the day, the expectation is that there will be 31 million, and this is by the, 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 the administration's own estimate, there will be 31 million Americans who remain without insurance. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the entire premise of the idea of Obamacare was that 100% of Americans would be covered. Now, we're talking about 3.3 million people who have signed up, but they're not telling us how many actually laid down their money. And that's what really is the mark of how many of these people truly have insurance, not whether or not they signed up 
and looked at plans and maybe threw a plan in their in their shopping cart, but whether or not they actually purchased and obtained a plan. Now, I admit, the administration may not necessarily have those numbers directly in front of them because they don't have a way to take money. I know. Don't even go there with me. I build websites for a living, and building an e-commerce website where you can't actually sell the, com the, the product is beyond my comprehension. However, they cannot take money. And so the insurers are taking money directly. But there should be at least some level of, uh, of, of acknowledgement of how many people have actually gotten and, and have an insurance card that they can walk into a doctor with and say, here we go. The other side of this is that what we need to recognize, when we, when we talk about 3.3 million people, that's really not what's important. Because we do know that almost 7 million now, or over 7 million, I should say, have actually lost their insurance due to Obamacare. So even if 3.3 million signed up, essentially that's less than half of those who actually lost it, which means of the 30 million who are uninsured, none of them have gotten insurance. So exactly what was the point? N net losses now would, would, would logically, assuming math is accurate, Net losses would show that we now went from 30 million uninsured to 33 million uninsured. Hmm. And at a cost of $2 trillion? Not to mention the loss of <laughs> unknown and, and for all intents and purposes, probably, perhaps unknowable privacy, security, personal information, control, Bill of Rights, remember all those little things that you've lost? So the question really is, if we've only got 3.3 million who signed up, how many are we paying for? How many of them are receiving subsidies that the taxpayer is responsible for? We need to know, and we're entitled to know. This is no state secret. This is not some NSA thing where they can say, well, we can't tell you because, of course, it has to remain a secret. It could endanger lives. The only lives in danger here are those of the taxpayers who are forking over their hard-earned money to cover we don't know who, or how, or when, or how much. It's pretty shameful when the administration hides its signature legislative achievement behind the guise of national security. There's nothing national and nothing definitely security related to Obamacare. We're entitled to know. And I, for one, am tired of hearing that everything can be couched behind the word secrecy. You know, secrecy is the mark of tyrants. It's not the mark of a, of a true and honest <clears throat> administration. And when this president first ran for office, his primary adage was that he was going to change the way business was done in Washington that he was going to pull back the veil and let us all see the wizard, that he was going to change the nature and the way in which the nation worked. Politics was going to be different under this man. No more secrets. No more dirty dealings. No more lobbyists. Well, with all due respect, this has become perhaps the most secretive, the most abusive presidency that we've ever seen. No other presidency in history has had this many lobbyists on their staff, this many people they've drawn off of the Ministry of Propaganda and the staffs at, at major newspapers and media organizations. No other administration has cracked down on whistleblowers who are actually telling the public what the government refuses to tell us about their inner workings. None. This administration is anything but transparent. And the transparency related to this Obamacare debacle, considering we spent, we don't, and, and right now there's, no almost, there's almost no accounting for how much we've actually spent on it. <clears throat> I mean, we know that we've seen numbers out there. We spent $600 million on a website that doesn't work. It still doesn't work for the record. But we don't know how much money. I mean, we see all these crazy marketing ads and all this stuff that's, been, that's being uh, promoted that's ancillary and corollary to Obamacare. But we have no idea what the total number of that cost is. So the real question is, how much have we spent? 
And then we haven't even begun yet to see the impact of the subsidies that we're giving out and the money that we're going to have to pay the doctors. And on top of that, the money we're going to have to pay the insurance companies for their losses because Congress refused to close that loophole, the loophole of a bailout for the insurance, aid, the insurance companies that are going to be tied and related to Obamacare. That number can literally, ladies and gentlemen, run into the trillions of dollars on top of the actual cost of the, of the program itself. See, the truth of the matter is that this entire thing was sold as smoke and mirrors. And the reason it really, truly matters to us is because we're already in a fiscal crisis. Our nation is at a crossroads. We can no longer afford the most basic necessities of our society. Adding an extraordinary expense in the case of frivolous bailouts for insurance companies who are already making record profits, spending untold billions of dollars on the most ridiculous ad campaigns to try to lure young people in to their doom. I mean, is this really appropriate expenditure of the taxpayer's dollar? When we see family incomes falling at the rate of $2,500 a year, and then we see the new imp imposition of, of taxes that are, going to be, that are going to raise that number even higher, we have to ask ourselves, is this a wise and, and appropriate expenditure of the taxpayer's revenue? Clearly it isn't. And the, there were so many other ways that Obamacare or health insurance could have been delivered to those people that needed it, including tax breaks and, and including uh, um, uh, health savings accounts. The truth is the health savings accounts, <clears throat> by all accounts, would have been a more appropriate way to do it because it would have made people say, excuse me, doctor, how much was that x-ray again? Because if you're telling me that it's going to be $250, I know I can go across the street and get the same x-ray for 150 and since this is my money I'm spending, I got to tell you, I'll be back in 15 minutes. That would make Americans careful about what they spent for their own health care. That would make hospitals and health care clinics across the country and pharmaceutical companies accountable for the cost of their product. It would bring competition to medicine, which would be a good thing, not a bad thing. Now we just have more of the same, no competition, doctors who recognize that they're going to be paid so much less that it's not even worth staying in their practice, and they're basically just leaving. Since we're responsible for all of this, and that's only in a dollar uh, uh, perspective, since we're going to see such a degradation of our health care service and, and the quality of the services that we have, aren't we entitled to know how big the, the price tag is going to be. I mean, you wouldn't walk into Chevy and say, I'll take that truck and I don't care what the sticker price is. Would you? You wouldn't walk in and say, I want that house over there, but I don't really care how much it costs. Just give me the paperwork. Why would we do that with Obamacare? Why would we do that with one-sixth of our national economy? The real crisis here, folks, is that we have no idea what we've gotten into. And to <laughs> throw out there a well-worn phrase, we had to pass it to see what was in it. Well, now that we see what's in it, Americans should be saying, we don't just request its repeal, we demand it. You've been listening to America's Voice Now. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to talk about our second topic, which is what happens when liberals think the president has gone too far. I'm going to introduce you to Jonathan Turley. He has an excellent website, by the way. It's jonathanturley.org. He is a constitutional professor and a uh, teacher at uh, George Washington University Law School. He's an author and, and very well regarded on both sides of the ideological fence. But he's also an Obama voter by his own admission, and he's a self-admitted supporter of most of the programs that President Obama has put forth. But he has an enormous amount to say about the very dangerous thing that's going on with executive uh, orders, 
and I think it's worthy of your hearing. This was on an interview last night with Megyn Kelly from Fox News. And um, I think you'll, you'll find and hear uh, that, uh, some very, very interesting statements from him in reference to that. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we'll talk about that. Uh, let's make sure that we visit and support our sponsors. You can find the folks over at Express Mini Marts 1 and 2 uh, in West Plains. One located up on 14 and 63 in Old Granny's Cafe. And the second located across the street from the city pool uh, on Porter Wagoner Boulevard and People's Park. And that lo- both locations have a drive through Please make sure that you take advantage of that. When you go in there, make sure that you tell those folks, hey, you know, I heard about you from America's Voice Now, and Mike was talking about you, and I wanted to let you know that I'm here to support you. Make sure that you see our friends over at the Battery Station. You can find their website at batterystation.com. You can also call them if you have any questions about their products and or services at 417-257-7799. Make sure that when you go into the Battery Station, you ask them to see the America's Voice Co-op Catalog. That enables you to buy bulk wholesale food, at bulk wholesale prices. I'm talking about a 50-pound bag of oatmeal or grain or wheat or whatever you'd like. 50-pound or 25-pound bags of salt and sugar. You're getting it at wholesale prices, folks. Greater than 50% off retail. Make sure that you take advantage of this program because Kevin over at Battery Station and I worked very hard to put it together. God bless Kevin. It's all, it's, it's all really on him. I, I'm just taking advantage of it for our listenership. But let's make sure that we're using it. You can make sure that you swing by Pizza Hut and you can get yourself a great lunch or a great dinner. Uh, every day they have a, su- a, a salad bar with a pizza bar and a uh, pasta bar. And then uh, on Tuesday night, kids eat free. It's family night. Tuesdays and Thursdays are a reduced price day. That's $5 lunch day. Please make sure that when you get there, you say to Bruce, Hey, Bruce, I heard about you on America's Voice. Thanks very much for supporting the program. Jason Henry over at the law offices of Jason Henry. You can find him on Court Square in West Plains. He handles both federal and state cases, both civil and criminal, and uh, specializes in firearm cases. So make sure that if you've got one of those, you give him a call at 417-256-4100. You can also uh, visit our friends while you're on the square at the uh, Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop if you're a smoker. And if you're not and you know someone who is, swing in there and grab them a nice gift uh, or a gift certificate. They also handle things like uh, sports parties and bachelor parties, even bachelorette parties. Uh, That's that's a mental picture I'm really not sure we can all envision, right? A bunch of girls sitting around in dresses smoking pipes. (laughs) But it might be interesting. Uh, You can reach those folks at 417-257-1776, and it's called Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop. You can also find our friends over at Wits End Classic Barbershop directly in front, and uh, you can get yourself a great haircut for 10 bucks. So make sure that you swing in there and do that. You can also reach our friends over at Airbridge Web Group. You can reach them by going to airbridgeweb.com, or you can call 417-204-4064. We're going to return in just a minute. Stick with us and uh, bring some friends along. You can find us streaming live on audio and video at americasvoicenow.org. You can also catch us live streaming on audio at Patriot FB. You can also make sure that you introduce your friends to us on YouTube. We post every show that we do up there on both audio and video after the show. And you can call our listen line 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 415-325-0725. We'll be right back. interesting when you take a look at um, what is happening with our executive uh, presidency. The idea of our national government in the eyes of our founders was that we would have the opportunity to provide by the three different branches of government the concept that each group would be so interested in their own survival that they would be willing to restrain 
one of the other three, if you will, groups from um, abusing the privilege and authority of their division. So the idea was that, in fact, our founders said very clearly that the Congress would be willing to take action against an executive who overreached his authority because Congress would jealously guard their own power and that the courts would do the same. They would want to jealously guard their power and authority as well. So the real question here is, why isn't that happening? I mean, you've got Congress and you've got the judiciary and the executive all effectively in line supporting each other's abuses. It's a disturbing concern, and it's one that every American, if they don't already have, should. Now, last night I saw an interview on Kelly, uh, uh, Megyn Kelly's show called The Kelly File on Fox News. She interviewed a gentleman, Jonathan Turley, who is a constitutional law professor. And I've seen Mr. Turley before. In fact, he was recently at a congressional hearing in which he was asked if or what he thought should or could be done in reference to uh, executive overreach. His, com his comments at that time were interesting, but he's expounded on this because he's, he's, a, he's discussing in this particular interview the most recent executive overreach where we have the president making consistent changes to Obamacare. I think it's up to 29 now. 29 changes to Obamacare all without congressional review or oversight or approval, none of which were passed by Congress. And our Constitution very clearly says, under, under Article 2, that our president is dramatically limited in his capabilities to make law. In fact, he has no authority to make law. Only Congress can make law. He must faithfully execute them. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the problem. He's done everything but faithfully execute them. And it's not just limited to Obamacare. He's extended his executive authority out into immigration and out into uh, international issues. And he's now extending it into things like the TPP and TTIP treaties, where he's asking for executive fast-track authority to make, these, to make these treaties or to approve these treaties without any amendments by the Senate. We're in dire straits, folks. And it's time that we recognize that. So I'm going to attempt to play this video for you. Um, I, I believe it'll pop up in the window over my shoulder. And if it doesn't, we'll just let, let you, I'll, I'll swing by and we'll do something else about the audio. Stick with me for a second. Let me make sure that we get this going. One of the nation's top constitutional lawyers sounding the alarm on what he sees as a radical expansion of presidential okay. powers. Audio and some brand new Fox polls suggest the American people are equally concerned. 60% now say they disapprove of the president using executive orders to go around Congress on his agenda. 74% believe this isn't really even the way government is supposed to work. Jonathan Turley is a constitutional attorney and professor at the George Washington University Law School. Uh, professor Turley, great to see you. I'm a big fan of you and your blogs. Your blog. Thank you. Let me ask you about this, because in that soundbite we played before we went to the commercial, you said the framers would be horrified. Uh, because everything they did was to create balance between the branches of government, and we've lost it. Expand on that. Well, I'm afraid it's quite serious, because the framers created a system that was designed to avoid one principal thing, that's the concentration of power in any one branch, because that balancing between these branches in this fixed orbit is what not only gives stability to our system, but it protects us against authoritarian power. It protects civil liberties from abuse. And what we've been seeing is the shift of gravity within that system in a very dangerous way that makes it unstable. And I think that's what the president is doing. I think that we've become a nation of enablers. We are turning a blind eye to a fundamental change in our system. I think many people will come to loathe that they remain silent during this period. Mm -hmm, it is nothing. To, yeah, we, we heard a lot of objections when President Bush expanded the powers of the presidency from the, from the left and from the media. They haven't been raising the same objections now that we have a Democrat in the White House. And you say they do so at their own peril. 
Well, I'm afraid this is beginning to border on a cult of personality for people on the left. I happen to agree with many of President Obama's policies. But in our system, it is often as important how you do something as what you do. And I think that many people will look back at this period in, in history and, and see nothing but confusion as to why people remain so silent when the president asserted these types of unilateral actions. You have a president who's claiming the right to basically rewrite or ignore or negate federal laws. Now, that's a very dangerous thing. It has nothing to do with the policies. Why is it, has it so to do with dangerous? Why, why is it so dangerous? I mean, what's, so, what's, what, what's so bad that's going to come of this? Well, you know, a system in which a single individual is allowed to rewrite legislation or ignore legislation is a system that borders on authoritarianism. Because it, I don't believe that we are that system yet. But we cannot ignore that we're beginning to become a system that's a pretense of democracy. If a president is allowed to take a law and just simply say, I'm going to ignore this, or I'm going to shift funds that weren't appropriated by Congress into this area. Um, the president's State of the Union indicated this type of unilateralism that he has adopted as a policy. Now, many people view that as it's somehow empowering. Mm -hmm. it, in my view, it's dangerous. That is, what he is suggesting is to essentially put our system offline. And this is not the first time that convenience has become the enemy of principle. But, what, but we've but never what, seen it to this extent. What is supposed to be done about it? You know, I know in your testimony before Congress, you cited Ben Franklin, who's, who believed that the other branches would work in their own self-interest to try to rein in uh, a president who got drunk on his own power, or however you want to put it. Um, you know, Congress doesn't have, they can, they can withdraw money, they can move to impeach, they can file lawsuits, which they've done. I mean, what are they supposed to do? Part of the problem really rests with the federal courts. For the last two decades, the federal courts have been engaged in a policy of avoidance. They are not getting involved when the executive branch exceeds its powers. They're just leaving this up to the branches. And often they say, well, Congress has the power of the purse. Congress can simply restrict funds. But one of the complaints against President Obama is that very clearly dedicated funds in areas like health care have been just shifted by the White House unilaterally to different areas. Mm -hmm. And the courts have, have adopted this avoidance principle. I am astonished at the degree of passivity in Congress, particularly among Democrats. You know, I, I first came to Congress when I was a young page, and there were people that fiercely believed in the institution. It didn't matter what party uh, held the White House. Right. But we're seeing now the usurpation of legislative authority that's unprecedented in this country. JonathanTurley.org, I recommend it. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, sir. What an interesting discussion. You know... I think, and, and by the way, folks, if you ever wanted to see an example of critical thinking, that, that's it right there. Um, by the way, there will be a, a link to this video in the YouTube, uh, in the description there. I apologize, we, you know, there, uh, in, in not being able to show you the actual video. Um, we are, our computer system here is so overburdened with various uh, configurations that it is impossible for me to make everything work in sync and I apologize but we're just we operate on a shoestring budget and it's basically comes out of my pocket so I just um, there's nothing that we can do to uh, to make that that uh, work flawlessly for you um, I will rectify it but frankly it's gonna have to wait until there's funding available to do it the issue here of this discussion is is important for a couple of reasons one it's an excellent example of critical thinking because it enables you to see how an individual who may be ideologically opposed to the concern that, he, that he's expressing here actually is willing to step back and look at the problem objectively, recognizing that irrespective of whether he approves of, of President Obama as an individual and whether he approves of the policies and the concepts that he's created, whether or not he agrees with these programs, and whether or not he likes him on a personal level. He's willing to step back and say, I also recognize that the Constitution has a, a, a set, if you will, of limitations and rules. And that even though I may like this person or like their concepts and policies, I still have to recognize that what they're doing is outside of the boundaries of law. Ladies and gentlemen, that's something that is refreshing to us because we don't often see it. The second issue that I wanted you to draw from this was a couple of things that he said. 
not the least of which was there is beginning to be a cult of personality associated with this president. And while we may have seen that waning a little bit over the Obamacare debacle, nobody likes to be lied to. And this president was clearly shown to be a bald-faced liar to America. I have to tell you, the fact that the president still has a 40% approval rate says a lot about the cult of personality comment. An individual who would sit there and lie to you <clears throat> with the intention of misleading you and having you approve of something that, quite frankly, is against your own best interest should have been enough for most Americans to say, I want nothing further to do with the man. But they didn't. 40% of America still approves of President Obama as an executive. Forget the policies, forget Obamacare, forget all the rest of that. The problem here, under the cult of personality con concern, is that when you have an individual who has that kind of popularity, despite the fact that they have personal and professional flaws, which obviously should have changed the minds and the mindset of those 40% of Americans, there's something really wrong with that. I mean, you wouldn't sit there and go to a church where you knew that the, the pastor or the minister, as an example, was saying one thing while doing on his per, in his personal life something completely different because his words have no credibility. And you would say, well, that person is not suitable to be my leader or my shepherd. By the same token, you wouldn't go to an attorney who you knew and had caught in a bald-faced lie that cost you money and say, I'm going to hire that person to represent me again. So why is it that we have a president that was, and, and it's not one lie, it's not five lies, it's, it's, it's dozens and dozens of lies. We're not just talking about Obamacare, we're talking about Benghazi. I mean, I hear these people talking about Benghazi all the time, saying, well, the president came out and, and you know, after he knew, 12, uh, you know, five days later, he was, wait a second, folks. The one thing I, I consistently don't hear anymore from anyone in the mainstream media, Fox News included, is that the president actually went two weeks after Benghazi occurred, and he went to the United Nations, and on the podium of the United Nations, he made the statement, he made that statement of lie again. And he did it in front of the entire world. No one's talking about that. They're just talking about his statements to the press in the United States. But no one's talking about what he said on the podium at the United Nations. The truth of the matter is, this man has been caught in a lot of lies. And it should be enough to dissuade most Americans from having any level of loyalty to his person. Forget, his, forget your political ideology. The other side to this is that he brought out the point that future generations are going to look back at this period in time and say, why did we allow that to happen? Who dropped the ball? Who refused to step in and, and stop the action when there was an opportunity to do so. Now that's interesting because it sheds some light on Mr. Turley's idea and his thinking. What it says is that if he feels that people will look back in time and his historically and say, why didn't they stop it then? Obviously, he expects that things are going to get worse. Right? I mean, think about it for a minute. His statement itself was an important one. In the way he couched it, he said, people are going to look back and wonder, why didn't they stop it then? Well, then means that it must continue. It must have continued in order to look back on it historically and say they let it go too far and they didn't stop it. So what I would have liked to have, hear, to have heard was the question posed to Mr. Turley, well, what do you expect to be the end result of all of this? 
certainly not Kelly, Megan Kelly's fault for not asking that, I suppose. I mean, there's a limited amount of time. But the upshot of the question still remains. We won't see the results of a lot of the activity of this president for time, uh, until time has passed. And if we continue down the road that we're on now, I would have loved to have heard his idea or his prediction, if you will, of how he envisions things to move as we go forward. He does have a blog, which I would strongly encourage you to visit. Uh, it is jonathanturley.org. And, um, you know, if you have an opportunity to, uh, t- it's, it's T-U-R-L-E-Y. And I would encourage you, if there's any way possible for you to, uh, to visit that website. Um, Bear with me a moment. Okay, so it's Jonathan, and that's spelled J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N. JonathanTurley.org. Um, if you have an opportunity to, it's probably not a bad idea for you to uh, take a look at that and and hear and, and read some of the things that he's gotten that he's he's got to say on this blog. Um, you know, as as an individual uh, who is quite interested in in constitutional law he's got a couple of things up here about civility rules and so forth and so on um and and he's got a bio up here as well that you'll probably find interesting but and and a group of columns so the, the upshot is do yourself a favor and go visit his website if at all possible you can find this particular um uh video on youtube and of course i'll have it in the body of of the uh the um YouTube video itself. But if you want to find it, you can do a search on YouTube for Obama's executive actions are very dangerous. And just type in Turley, T-U-R-L-E-Y. <clears throat> Overall, I think the, pro- the real concern that we need to have at this stage in the game is how do we stop the actions of the president? We know, and I, I mean, we keep hearing, well, Congress can take away the money Right by withhold the, at least the House can withhold the purse strings, but they're not doing so. Well, the courts could step up, but they're not doing so. In fact, you heard Mr. Turley very clearly state that the courts, for the last twenty years, have actually done nothing and have allowed this to continue to go on. Why? You know, the Supreme Court. There's nothing that would bar. Roberts, the, the, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, from saying, hey, you know what? We've got a problem here, and we have a constitutional crisis that is being caused by this president based upon his executive action. But we don't hear that. Why? You know, the truth is, it's very interesting when you think about the, the concept of how much, um, uh, how much we don't know about about the issues of what this administration is is really got up its sleeve i mean we see the president misleading us and 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 misdirecting us and telling you know telling lies to us but we also know that while while the president is doing those things and congress is ignoring it and the courts are ignoring it he's also gathering an enormous amount of power up underneath the federal government that really doesn't belong to them and hasn't been attributed to them. When we look at what our founders had to say about that, the, um, the concept of Washington or having all powers up underneath Washington and Washington being, if you will, the, the fulcrum or the pivot point, Jefferson said, when all government, domestic and foreign, in little as in great things, shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power, it will render powerless the checks provided of one government on another and will become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we separated. Where he's talking about there is that once government, domestic and foreign, and when I say domestic and foreign, he meant both domestically here in the United States and the individual states themselves. The states were considered foreign, uh, foreign governments, if you will. 
in little as in great things, shall be drawn to Washington as the center of all power. It will render powerless the checks provided. So that's why we don't see a Tenth Amendment that's honored anymore. Because the states themselves have actually capitulated, just like the Congress, just like the courts. The states themselves have given up. The states have given up and refuse at this stage in the game to realistically sit and, and, and bar the activities that are, that are you know, part and parcel of a federal government out of control. The states actually have a greater authority than the federal government, but they refuse to utilize it or acknowledge it. And that in and of itself is frightening. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the debt increase. For the record, they reduced or, or they, they lifted the debt increase and made legal basically between now and March of 2015 any amount that Obama wants to borrow. There's no more checks and balances on it. There's no question. All he's got to do is just turn around to the Treasury and say, we need more. Or the Treasury can go to him and say, hey, you know, we need more to cover this or that or Obamacare or anything else. No questions asked. No one can say, hey, flag on the play there. That's too much. By this vote and lifting the debt ceiling with no cap. I mean, they didn't say you have permission to borrow another trillion. They said you have permission to borrow until March of 2015. Big difference, folks. Big difference. That's the equivalent of you walking into your bank and, and saying, I need more money. And they say, OK, here's 20,000. Or you walk into your bank and you say, I need more money. And they say, great, here's an unlimited credit line. Just come back to us in 60 days and let us know how much you borrowed. You've been listening to America's Voice now. Please make sure that you visit our sponsor over at the Battery Station. You can uh, get a hold of Kevin there at 417-257-7799 or visit them online at batterystation.com. Our friends over at Pizza Hut where you can get yourself a great lunch or dinner. Um, they're open uh, uh, seven days a week, but Monday through Thursday they have a great lunch special where they have an, uh, an open salad bar and a pizza bar and a pasta bar. Uh, and at night they often uh, offer the uh, buffet as well. And on Tuesday night, families uh, it's family night and kids under 12 eat free. So make sure that you swing in there and uh, take advantage of that. That, that location is on Porter Wagoner Boulevard. They also uh, deliver. So if, you have a, if you're interested, give them a call and they can certainly... Uh, uh, swing over and drop a pizza off to you. The uh, law offices of Jason Henry at uh, number 10 Court Square in West Plains, 417-256-4100. Uh, handle civil and, and uh, criminal cases, uh, including the standard DUI and things like that, but, and, and, and drug charges and so forth and so on, but also uh, handles um, uh, family law cases relating to custody and marital issues and so forth, but also federal cases as well and state cases related especially to firearms. So if you've got a case that falls under that, that line or that area, then make sure that you uh, contact him at 417-256-4100. Make sure that you see our friends over at the Express Mini Marts 1 and 2. Uh, number 1 is a uh, nice location right across the street on, for, on Porter Wagoner Boulevard, right across the street from the city pool in West Plains. And they've got a drive through there, discount tobacco facility, and they've got the lowest prices on tobacco and fountain drinks that you can get anywhere. They also have a drive through in both of their locations. And uh, their second location is up on 14 and 63, right there in what used to be Granny's Cafe. And all of you know uh, Granny's Cafe because it was kind of a, if you live in the area, uh, it was kind of an icon or, or iconic uh, breakfast place in the mornings for many, many years. So <clears throat> you can swing into either location through their drive through Please make sure that you take advantage of that. Porter, uh, excuse me, Patriot Cigar and Tobacco Shop at 257-1776. And uh, also our friends over at Wits End Classic Barber Shop. You can reach them at 417-372-2027. Uh, Jason does a great job with a haircut in there for 10 bucks, but he also does the hot lather shave with the old straight razor and the whole nine yards. Hot towel, all of that. Make sure that you uh, thank them for sponsoring AVN. We'll be right back. The 
It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to the second half of America's Voice Now. Hope that you... um, Hope that you're enjoying our show this morning. Well, thank you for uh, joining with us. You know, debt is a dangerous thing. And when we talk about the amount of debt that we have and we currently carry right now, um, it's quite scary. Thomas Jefferson said to us, a private central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army. We must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. That's an interesting statement. One, he's trashing the concept of a, fe- of a Federal Reserve Central Bank. And two, he's making it clear that loading us up and loading ourselves up with perpetual debt is, is a dangerous thing. In fact, he says it's so dangerous that it's the greatest menace that we have, and even greater than that of a standing army. He wasn't fooling around, was he? In fact, what I find the most important about his perspective on debt was that he had a very clear window in which he said debt should be built up. Because he recognized that, of course, nations do have to, from time to time, borrow, either for a war or some kind of a you know, national issue. But, and, and so he, he wasn't, he wasn't you know, one of these people that says absolutely no debt, but he was clear about what he did expect for it. He said, but with respect to future debt, would it not be wise and just for that nation to declare in the Constitution they are forming that neither the legislature nor the nation itself can validly contract more debt than they may pay within their own age or within the term of 19 years. It is incumbent on every generation to pay its own debts as it goes, a principle which, if acted on, would save one-half the wars of the world. Wow. So not only does he tell us right up front that Debt has a place, but a very limited, finite window to it. But he's also indicating that debt itself is one of the greatest causes of suffering and pain and agony and loss of life the world has ever known. Yet we have completely and utterly failed to respect and adhere to that advice. Why? You see, the truth is, the people who are voting for this debt, they knew what Jefferson said, too. They've probably read it at some point in time in their lives. And they have ignored it because it's not in their best interest to listen to it. George Washington, and by the way, for the record, just so you don't make the mistake of thinking that that Jefferson was the lone wolf out there on the debt issue, he wasn't. Washington himself, in 1793, said, No pecuniary consideration is more urgent than the regular redemption and discharge of the public debt. On none can delay be more injurious or an economy of time more valuable. What he was saying is that the, the concept of paying off the debt on a regular basis and discharging it 
is the most urgent thing that we have going in the nation. And that delaying, nothing is more injurious or more damaging to our economy than allowing debt to build. That's interesting. Yet, the Senate yesterday approved blatantly, blindly, a staggering change to our national debt scenario. John Boehner and the House did so a couple of days ago. McConnell, who's, by the way, in a fight for his seat right now, he's got primary candidates running against him in Kentucky, and he is the minority leader in the House, in the, excuse me, minority leader in the Senate, and he voted to end the debate on the debt limit legislation and to not allow a filibuster to happen. Cruz and some of the others in the, in the Senate were against it and said, you know, you shouldn't just let this thing go to vote because there's no way we can stop it. Right now, as you know, the Democrats rule the, the Senate. And Harry Reid rules with an iron hand. The Republicans did vote no on the debt, 53 to 44. That's right, along, that's right along the ideology lines or the political party lines. But you see, and the Republicans voted no, but they voted no knowing full well that they weren't, they weren't going to be able to stop it, number one. And number two, that was the CYA, if you will, so that when they go home to their districts, those of them who are, who are running, and as you know, only one-third of the Senate rolls over every two years, those who were running could say, hey, I voted no. But they knew that they were agreeing. The truth of the matter is, you know, if you were listening to Turley's comments earlier, Congress has an obligation and a responsibility to protect us from this exact situation, this debt. What's more disturbing is that this isn't just debt, guys. This is something far worse. This is a blank check that this administration can utilize to borrow any amount of money between now and March of 2015. That's one year and what? a month and a half away. We're in the middle of February, and this authority extends to the end of March of 2015. So that's 13 and a half months. I got to tell you, if we look back historically at what the nation has been borrowing, in the last two and a half years, we borrowed $2.6 trillion. What does that tell you? I mean... We're borrowing staggering sums of money. Right now, according to the debt clock, we are sitting at $17.3 trillion. That's already greater than our gross domestic product. The amount of money that the nation produces in gross production. We're at $17.290 trillion or $17.3 trillion. Right now, for the record, every citizen currently is indebted to the amount of $54,454. Every citizen. <clears throat> That's whether you are a baby or on your deathbed as an old person. That is whether you are illegal or illegal. That is whether you are a man or a woman. That is whether you are black or white or red. That is whether you are gay or straight. That is whether you are a believer in the principles of women's liberation or not. That is whether you are a pet owner or not. That is whether you work or don't work. Every citizen, every living, breathing person who claims citizenship as, uh, under the banner of the United States of America is responsible for $54,450. Uh, Fifty-five grand. Now, it's interesting that if you multiply that number times three, 
That's what each taxpayer is responsible for. So that should tell you something. Only one in three people is paying taxes. I mean, if you look at it from that perspective... The debt per taxpayer is 149960 150 grand. 150000 bucks. So here's the argument. If you have a job and you work, you're responsible for 150 grand. Do you have it? I mean, if you had to write a check today, could you do it? This isn't... This isn't a small amount of money. It's actually, I mean, if you want to look at it from this perspective, the debt per citizen at fifty fifty five thousand dollars is higher, higher than the average income in America. The average income is only fifty two thousand. So you're responsible for an entire year worth of your of your income. And then some. And that's assuming you had to pay no taxes and you didn't have to spend a penny on your bills. What I find even more interesting is the fact that taxpayers, on top of the fact that we're, you know, we're sitting on this debt, up, just up until now, we've, for this year, for this fiscal year, the federal tax revenue that's been drawn off of the individual taxpayer, we're not talking about we're not talking about corporations, right? We're not talking about any, any of that. We're just talking about federal tax revenue for income tax alone is $1.3 trillion and another $1 trillion in payroll taxes. That's $2.2 that's $2 trillion has been contributed so far by taxpayers. The same taxpayers who still owe another fifty four grand. <laughs> wow. Where does it end? The truth is, I warned about this back at the last fiscal crisis we had. Because I said to you that under the rules that they were agreeing to, they were going to give this president a blank check to write whatever he wanted against it. And people said, that's not so. Oh, yes, it was. And it is today. Speaker Boehner, <clears throat> what a disappointment to America, huh? You know, he went into a Tuesday morning meeting at the Capitol Hill Club where they gathered for a breakfast to discuss how they were going to vote on this debt thing. And they'd been arguing about whether or not they should tie to the debt and an approval of the debt any, you know, limitations on Obamacare or the spending towards Obamacare or whether or not they should put a limit on the, the bailouts that are coming for the insurance companies. And they've been haggling back and forth about, you know, should we or shouldn't we? And, you know, the last time we did that, the press made us look like a bunch of meanies and, you know, we lost a lot of face and now we've got elections coming up in just a few short months and what should we do and blah, 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 blah. And the article that's in the Washington Post says, after listening to a handful of colleagues flatly discuss fundraising strategies for 30 minutes, Boehner stood up, walked past dozens of sleepy, coffee-sipping Republicans, and woke the room up with an update. Here's what he said. Listen, we're going to move forward. That's how he woke the room up. Instead of bringing up the leadership plan, which they just issued only a week or two ago, and that, in that plan they would link a restoration of recent military cuts, you know, the ones that were drawn off the, uh, the retirees' pensions. They were going to try to link that to the, to the debt ceiling and say, if you're going to have the debt ceiling, that's fine, but you've got to reinstate the pensions. They decided instead that they'd just push through a clean bill, and a clean bill means no strings attached. We're going to get this done, Boehner continued. No strings attached. You 
you got to wonder what was the motivation for that he said he was going to stop reaching for votes on the plan this is what people in the meeting have said no strings attached and he wasn't even going to <clears throat> float another proposal he was going to do what he thought was best for the GOP in spite of the widespread angst. Boy, when I read a sentence like that, <laughs> he was going to do what he thought was best for the GOP. Really? I didn't know that anyone took an oath to protect and preserve the party. I was under the mistaken impression, I guess, that you took an oath to defend and protect the Constitution of the United States, to faithfully execute the laws therein, and to make sure that those things that you did on behalf of those that you represented were in the best interest of the nation and your constituencies. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm sorry. I... I I didn't realize that your first and foremost fiduciary responsibility, Mr. Boehner, was to the party, not to the tens of thousands of people who are sitting at home. You see, that's an open admission, if you will, of treason. Treason because you've abdicated and betrayed your constituency. Period. End of discussion. You didn't take an oath to keep the party alive, Mr. Boehner, and all the rest of you up there on Capitol Hill. And I don't care which party you adhere or you align yourself with. Not a single one of you took an oath to protect and defend your party. Not a single one of you. And frankly, your party is not going to be the one who's responsible to pay this debt off. And how dare you saddle us with debt so that you enhance the party's reputation at our expense. Boehner's greatest fear is that the party's reputation would be besmirched if he got drawn into another dramatist battle with the tyrant-in-chief, the liar-in-chief, the illegal alien-in-chief, the Manchurian candidate-in-chief over the debt. And instead of actually standing up and saying, you know, what's right for America is that we actually have the rule of law in charge. Instead of saying, what's right for America is that we do something to rein this president in and prevent him from further constitutional violations, including using the one weapon we have called the purse strings. He decided that, quote, we're not going to make ourselves the story. That's his statement, not mine. Mr. Boehner, you're not the story. We are the story. Obama is not the story. You and your party are not the story. We are. And you have forgotten that. The same with McConnell. There's no difference. But things get even worse. After Boehner spoke, it says here that the room of Republicans sat up, stunned that Boehner was abruptly shifting away from his own leadership plan, which had been championed by him just 12 hours earlier. Nobody cried out. Nobody booed. A couple of members leaned over and said, 
you know, he's right. You know, we can't make another debacle out of ourselves. We got to do what's right. Elections are only around the corner. So Boehner stood up there and cowed. Nobody stood up and spoke. Nobody clapped. Boehner stood there for a moment after he finished. He cast his eyes around the room. And he stepped off and he walked off towards his seat. On the way over to his seat, he shook his head. He turned around and he looked at the crowd. And he wondered aloud why he wasn't getting applause. Here's what he said. I'm getting this monkey off your back, and you're not going to even clap? Wow. You know what? If that's what Boehner considers his duty... If that's what Boehner considers his job, to get the monkey off the back of the GOP so that they can all continue to have their cushy jobs and their influence, I'm ashamed to admit that they're American. I'm getting this monkey off your back, and you're not going to even clap? Mr. Boehner, the only thing that I could clap for would be your resignation. You, sir, you give America a bad name. You've been listening to America's Voice now. When we come back, so now we've touched on Congress's stupidity idiocy and hypocrisy and when we come back we're going to talk about the White House's hypocrisy because Michelle Obama the new Marie Antoinette says let him eat cake while she wears a $12,000 dress to a state dinner honoring the French president Hollande as he imposes a tax of 75% in socialistic fashion on his own people. Hello. What exactly was it, Michelle, that you were thinking while you ordered a $12,000 dress? We'll be right back. You're listening to America's Voice. You can find us at americasvoicenow.org. Please do so. If you can help us financially, folks, we could really, really, really use it. Um... I, you know, I'm, I'm at the personal limit of my stretch, so you can go to our website and you can do, through, do so through PayPal, <clears throat> or you can just mail us a check or a money order to America's Voice Now, P.O. Box 1195, West Plains, Missouri, 65775. We'll be right back. things before we get too far into this segment today. Um, One, Jason Smith, the representative for the 8th District, has filed a piece of legislation that you should be aware of because um, it would force the federal government to give back the Ozark Scenic National Riverways. Now, if, if you're not locally from the area and you've never been down here, we've been fighting this going back for quite some time now. But 
<clears throat> basically in the 60s, the federal government came to the state of Missouri and put a gun to the head of the state and said, you got two choices. Either you can keep your land, <clears throat> at which point we're going to have the Army Corps of Engineers flood the entire valley system and flood the river and turn it into a giant reservoir, which you'll have no control over because the Army Corps of Engineers will then own it, or you can give the land to the federal government. And <clears throat> Missouri cowed and gave them the land. They immediately stepped in and through eminent domain, either bought out or pushed out or forced out or coerced out those people who lived anywhere near the border of the river and ba built a buffer zone on both sides of the river to keep it, quote, pristine. They've tyrannically controlled it for the last 40-some, 50 years. Now they've come out with a new program to reduce and, and uh, limit access even further. And uh, we've been fighting it because we're the people who live here. It's our river. We go and fish in it, and we camp in on it, and we canoe on it, and we, you know, use it for what we want to use it for, recreationally and otherwise. But... The Park Service doesn't really want that. So they're trying to reduce the amount of access to it. And they're also responsible for all of the law enforcement and maintenance of it, which they do a terrible job, by the way, on the maintenance side. The state did a far better job, and the Conservation Department for the state of Missouri does a far better job on the property that they maintain, which is outside of the boundaries of this. Upshot is we've actually decided in this area and you should be, if you're living in an area that is not uh, local here and you don't, you're not familiar, you can send me an email. But essentially what's happened here is this. We've decided to go on the offensive and change the rules by saying, you know what, we're going to stop asking you to stop and cease the beatings. We're just going to take the doggone property back from you. And so... We've been promoting this here on America's Voice Now. We're not alone. Many other folks, including the property rights groups like PRCnews.org and TruthFarmer.com and many other folks have been promoting Americans against, uh, uh, Missourians against Agenda 21 and a host of other groups. We've all been fighting for the return of this property, to take the property back from the federal government, put it back up underneath the ownership and control and maintenance of the state of Missouri. Well, the other day, Jason Smith, who's the new representative for the 8th District where the river sits, or rivers sit, there's actually a couple of them, he filed a bill to return the property to state control, ownership and or control. I applaud that. <clears throat> for the record, Jason's a Republican. Um, I've been critical of him in certain instances, but I've also applauded him when he's done the right thing. And I want you to be aware of the fact that you should, and your groups, if you're a property rights coalition leader or you're a civic leader or a group leader in your county or your state or your or whatever, you should be operating under the, the concept that when a politician does the right thing, we applaud them and we give them you know, uh, uh, we, we give them accolades for doing the right thing. We do want to make sure that they recognize that we see it when they do the right thing. By the same token, when they do the wrong thing, we need to make sure that we point that out and that we don't shirk from our duty because we may be allied by, uh, you know, by some intellectual idea or, or political idea or party affiliation or something like that. Now, you know, those of you who listen to me on a routine basis know that I'm not really one of those people who is um, ideologically tied to a party. In fact, you've heard me probably use the phrase before, I, I am unbiased. I hate all politicians. And it is the truth. I don't think either party accurately or adequately represents us. But I have to say I'm far more allied with the ideas of conservatism than I am with liberalism. Personally, I've found fault with Jason on quite a few things, but I've also found he's done a fairly good job in the time that he's been in there. And surprising to me in some ways, because I kind of, I had my doubts. And I'm willing to admit that, 
which, by the way, ought to be the mark, the hallmark of people who are critically, who, who, who are willing to exercise critical thinking. Jason surprised me positively. It's interesting. I still can't comment on his Facebook page. I've been blocked. It's a little disturbing, isn't it? I mean, I am a constituent after all. By the same token, I'm still willing to give him credit where it's due. The truth of the matter is that when a politician does the right thing, we should make sure they get credit for it. When a politician does the wrong thing, we need to make sure they get credit for that too. So, one of the things that is important here is that we want to make sure and we're going to press very hard with the idea that we want this property back. And if you don't live here, and it's really not pertinent to you, what I want you to do is kind of keep an eye on it and follow it, and I'll tell you why. Because it can become a model for what you can be doing in your own backyard. You know, we successfully beat the Blue Ways back and got the Department of the Interior. Here we are, a bunch of hillbillies down in the, in the Ozarks, and we got the federal government to step back and rescind the Blue Ways on a national level. That's quite an accomplishment, folks. I mean, this is a low, uh, you, you know, low population density area. I mean, there are very, you know, this is very rural. And so for, these, for th this amount of folks to get together to fight back against something like that was quite stunning. We've had the same level of turnout on this Ozark Scenic National Riverways war. And the truth of the matter is, you know, we've, and I'm pleased to say that many people in this area have seen the result of the actions that we've taken and have been reinvigorated. I think that's the right word. <laughs> they see success and they feel positive about it. So, don't underestimate, just because you don't live here, the value of this story that's happening. The Blue Ways, we successfully fought. And we did it creatively and aggressively. Now we're doing the same thing with the Ozark Scenic Riverways. And you can use this as a model in your state or county or city or town or whatever. So keep an eye on it because it's an important issue as we move forward. There's a lot of politicians who... Uh, have stepped up to help in this fight. Um, and some of them I agree with, some of them I don't agree with. Some of them I don't, I, I don't uh, support. I don't, I don't endorse anybody, but some of these people, I, I, you, know, um, I, you know, have for all intents and purposes in many cases done things which I completely disagree with. But when they do right, we give them credit. There is one guy, by the way, who has kind of stepped up above the fray there as a state, as a state um, politician. His name is, uh, he's the lieutenant governor. His name is Peter Kinder. And I got to say, uh, in, on Kinder's behalf, this guy has really stepped up, and I'm very, very um, appreciative of his efforts on this issue of both the Blue Ways. He fought very, very hard with us on the Blue Ways, and also on this issue of the Ozark, uh, o Ozark Scenic National Riverways. He has been a, uh, he's been a breath of fresh air as a politician. And if I find that he does something wrong, I'll be the first one to throw him under the bus. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But he is the lieutenant governor, and that carries some clout. He is the, on the opposing political side of our governor, which is the way that things used to be uh, from our founders, right? The, the, when you, when you um, if you look at what, what transpired with our founders, the idea that um, uh, the opposing party was actually the party that... Uh, took the vice presidency kind of interesting right we don't do that anymore now we got joe biden instead <laughs> hello okay let's get on to michelle and her complete and utter um and and, and quite frankly ridiculous uh twelve thousand dollar dress you know the hubris and the arrogance and, and, and perhaps even more disturbing was not the fact that Michelle wore a $12,000 dress. I kind of expect her to act like an imperialistic queen. 
she's giving me, given us and me per- personally no reason to believe anything better of her. But she appears to be incapable of seeing the hypocrisy and the, and, the, and the irony that is the reality of her actions. I mean, what bothers me about this is that they're throwing a state dinner for President Hollande from France. And this is a guy who just passed a 75% tax against millionaires in his own country. He's an avowed socialist and a hardcore one. And our nation and France, by the way, France under the, underneath the European Union and the United States underneath the Federal Reserve, you know, we're all in big trouble financially. Our citizenry are all struggling to make ends meet, be, be able to basically determine whether or not they're going to pay the, the uh, insurance bill this month. For the most Americans, it's a question of do I pay the heating bill or do I pay the electric bill? Our incomes have fallen. Our jobs are disappearing. And she and the imperial chieftain decide they're going to throw a state dinner for this guy from France. And she has the gall to wear a ten dollars or $12,000 dress. You know, that, that's why I wrote that title, Let Him Eat Cake. Because Michelle reminds me of... Marie Antoinette. You know, Marie Antoinette, she was the person who um, was the queen in France during the French Revolution, and they eventually took her head off over it because she was the one who came out and in her silken gown said, well, let them eat cake. I don't care if they're starving in the streets. I don't care if they're eating each other. Let them eat cake. It's not my problem. I'm the queen, and I've got to get my nails done. You know what was even worse? The topic of discussion on CNN was not the hubris and the arrogance of that. They spent the entire segment gushing about the dress. <laughs> I mean, I look at that dress, and at no point in time, now granted, I don't wear dresses, so it's probably not, you know, something that I... And I'm, I'm not very fashion conscious. But when you are on a national television program and your, um, you know, your principal role is to talk about news, um, I, I'm not sure that the glitz and the glamour of the dinner is really as important as some of the is- issues surrounding it, like the fact that you're wearing a $10,000 dress when the country's going broke. And they were all gushing about, you know, who it was a Herrera gown, and I don't even know who Herrera is. But I got to tell you, anybody who makes a 10000 or 12000 or however many thousand dollar dress, you know... That's not exactly what is in line with what the average American is concerned about. I mean, right now, there are literally tens of thousands of American families who are trying to figure out how they're going to keep the house warm because the cost of propane is up to four and five dollars a gallon. And the cost of home heating oil in the Northeast is up at three ninety-five and four dollars plus a gallon. And these people are trying to figure out how they can pay the bills. They're trying to figure out how they're going to make their limited budget that's shrinking every day cover the cost of food and the utilities they need just to keep warm and light I'm insulted by Michelle Obama I'm insulted because she actually believed that it was appropriate to wear that gown she felt 
like it's her right. And I'm insulted that she is so incapable of empathy for the nation that she would actually wear that dress. I mean, even if the president and and the first lady have the ability to, you know, wear the fancy clothes and, you know, go on these multi-million dollar vacations and all that, don't you think they have, at least if nothing else, a moral and ethical obligation to, you know, not stick it in your face and rub it in? I'm not saying they're not entitled to a vacation. I'm just saying the extravagance of the lifestyle that they're leading is not a little over the top. And here we are talking about a new debt limit and (laughs) trillions of dollars of spending of money that we don't have, can't afford, have to borrow. A president who's you know, expanding the the national scope of his power and authority outside of constitutional permission. A boondoggle of his signature uh, um, legislative achievement, which has cost us untold billions and billions and billions of dollars at this point. And she's got the nerve to come out in a $12,000 dress. I want the First Lady to look good. I think she should. I want them to live comfortably. I think they should. That's the role and the function of the presidency. And I respect the office of presidency. But at the same point in time, she's perverting it. There's something dirty about the way in which they flaunt that role. And they're not alone. Bush did it too. But these guys, for some reason, are just a little over the top. You know, these high-end parties loaded up with with uh, Hollywood starlets and, and, you know, having private parties for their kids with people that you know they uh, the these these hollywood and 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 music stars that would you know charge a a, a dictator a million bucks to have that party but they go over there and they hold a private birthday party with a concert for their kid and stuff like that i don't know something's wrong with that something's wrong with that And the truth is, something's wrong with us for allowing it. The fact that we're willing to accept that, the fact that our media is willing to sit there and talk about the dress itself, (laughs) and instead of talking about the fact that, you know, the president is literally over the top, Which is their job. They're not supposed to be, you know, I mean, if you want to talk fashion, there's a place for that. But it's not on a national news program when the nation is in such trouble. I guess that's my point. All right. The, um, I wish I had that Pelosi clip. I'll try to find that for you today, too. She talked about Obamacare the other day. <laughs> You know, she's talking about this job lock nonsense. And she's so out of touch. Her arrogance and the way she flips her head about as she's talking is just insulting. And frankly, I'm, I'm tired of it. All right. Before we wrap for the day, I'm going to ask you guys if there's any way that you can assist us with um, some of our expenses. I, I generally hate to talk about money and, you know, I fund everything from AVN out of my pocket. And, uh, you know, there's been, there's, there's some help from some folks. I'm I'm not 
um, and I certainly don't want to uh, make it sound as if no one does uh, contribute. They do. There's, there's some folks that contribute consistently every month, and I'm extraordinarily grateful for them. And there are some folks that have stepped up and made a one-time uh, donation or a gift that has been extraordinarily touching. You know who you are. I don't want to give your name out over the year, but I'm telling you right now, there's some folks that have really, man, done the right thing. But our expenses do go on. It's expensive to be on the radio. It's expensive to be on the air. It's expensive to buy all the equipment that's necessary. If you find that this show is valuable to you, then I would ask you that you, you assist us and participate. I, you know, every widow's might helps. I know that the economy is tough. Uh, we don't, I, I don't take any money, and I don't use any money for my own personal. In fact, it costs me money every month. So you can be assured of one thing. I'm not living high on your dime. <laughs> um, I I spend money every month to do this program. So, and there's been no remuneration ever. <laughs> and the odds of it are of it happening any time in the near future are not great either. So, here's my point: if you can help us, I'd be extraordinarily grateful. You can make a donation to us by PayPal up on our website by going to AmericasVoiceNow.org. Uh, there you can use a credit card or a PayPal account. Even if you don't have a PayPal account, you can still use a credit card to make a one-time donation or to make a monthly pledge. Either would be extraordinarily gr uh, appreciated, and I'd be extraordinarily grateful to you as an individual and a patriot. If you prefer to use a money order or a check, you can certainly do that. You can mail it to us at America's Voice Now, P.O. Box 1195, and that's in West Plains, Missouri, Six five seven seven five. I'll give that to you again. It's America's Voice Now, P.O. Box eleven ninety five, and that's in West Plains, Missouri. Six five seven seven five. You know the sponsors who keep us on the air are uh, certainly appreciated. They uh, advertise with the radio programs and, and and the broadcasting mechanisms that we use to to get the show out to you. Uh, but we don't get any of that. So. Um, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm grateful that they help defray the cost that otherwise I would have to bear even more. Um, and so I ask that you support these folks because these are the guys that are, uh, especially on, on Big Country 99 and, and local radio station uh, stations, they are the ones who are making sure that the bills get paid over there and that AVN can continue to broadcast. So please visit our friends over at Wits End Classic Barbershop at 417-372-2027. You can also visit uh, Patriot... Uh, cigar and Tobacco Shop. You can reach them at 417-257-1776 and the law offices of Jason Henry. You can reach him at 417-256-4100. All three of those are on the square in West Plains. If you have an interest in, in uh, dealing with a, a legal issue, whether it be civil or criminal, uh, the law offices of Jason Henry can certainly help you. And he handles both state and federal cases, including firearms cases as a specialty. Our friends over at Express Mini Marts 1 and 2, they're a brand new sponsor for us, and uh, we're very glad to have them on board. You can uh, find them at 14 and Junction, uh, or the corner of 14 and Route 63 on the northern end of West Plains. They're in uh, Old Granny's Cafe building, which is kind of a well-known area, or well-known building in the area. And um, they have the lowest prices on, uh, on uh, uh, fountain drinks. In the area, they start at $0.39 cents and on up, and they have that in both of their locations. And, and that's the second location is right across the street from the pool uh, in West Plains on uh, People's Park on Porter Wagoner Boulevard. Please make sure that you see our friends at Pizza Hut as well, who have great, uh, great uh, lunch specials out there. And on Tuesday night, kids eat free. And um, I encourage you to visit those folks. If you're interested in having uh, e-learning uh, software developed for your business, um, or you're interested in getting a website developed for your business, please uh, give us a call over at uh, Airbridge Web. Uh, you can visit the website at airbridgeweb.com. You can also contact at 417-204-4064. If you'd like to communicate with America's Voice Now, you can send me email to mike at americasvoicenow.org. You can call our hotline and leave a message at 417-204-5130. You can call into the program if you'd like at 417-204-5141 when we're live on the air. And our listen line 